they claim I ordered a war against DC. And uh and this is how the thing trickled over in Lewisbury when uh, my man raised them because they said that I ordered a war and every white dude on the yard got crushed. So they say we got to send them to Colorado. Okay, and that's where we met. You see how we walking through this? Now, tell them how we met from your first day walking in ADX Supermax where we met at in the shoe and how we connected so they understand. Well, what happened was when they sent me to Colorado, you know, when they do a transfer order, they have to explain why you want to move him. They said I was the leader of the DC Blacks and that if I stayed in Murray, that would be ongoing wars because that I was trying to get back because I was stabbed in 1986 by some white supremes. And they thought since I'm back in the system, that it's going to be ongoing wars. So when the war jumped off in Murray and they sent me to ADX, the warden and them met me at the door and say, this is where you're going to die at. This is Supermax ADX Colorado. We know who you are. We know you're the leader of D.C. And this is where you're going to die at. So they put me up there next door to you. And a couple of days later, Chapman Keith and them came to my door and said, man, uh, you got to get your phone call because your family just called up here, man. And, and I hate to be the bird of bad news, man, but your brother just got murdered. I said, nah, nah, man, nah, nah. He said, man, please call your mother and your family. So I get on the phone, and my sister and them said, man, they just killed Rock. I said, what? So I'm over there hard and screaming. And I hear a brother call me in the vintage. He said, hey, brother, I feel your pain, man. I had to go through the same thing, man. The feds killed my brother. I said, who your brother? You said, man, you remember the girl, Kimberly Smith, out of Virginia, who they said, uh, was on a conspiracy, you said that was my brother, man. They killed him. And I needed to hear that, man, because, man, I'm grieving, you know, because, man, this is my man, man. I'm talking about two kid me, my whole bit. Never had to ask for nothing twice. Everybody sit, everybody say, man, when it come to fly, Rock love him to death. So I'm in pain, but I'm listening to the voice and I'm wondering how you look, but. I need to hear everything you said to me. And I so I said, I appreciate that, brother. And we stay in the vent for hours talking. Man, I ain't want to get out. You know what I mean? Because I needed somebody to talk to that had some sense. And I was sensing. I said, man, you're a good dude, man. I said, I appreciate that. I said, in fact, my sister is in Danbury right now with that same girl you said, man, on case with your brother. So you gave me the game about how they hooked up. You gave me the whole history and the whole story, but you gave it to me in the raw because you know how they was depicting her and she was a college girl in the square and all that. So once you and I start talking and I start telling you, I said, man, who here? I said, I got a cousin here named David Ford, man. Right? I say, where's Silk in there? So I'm asking you all these questions. I'm asking you about the jump. But I'll never forget, brother, I appreciate you so much because I need to get back on that phone. I don't know what you did. You made me bring that phone up there for me. I said, man, uh, I got to get back on that phone. You said, I'm going to get it up here. And then you sent me a few things over there I needed, man. And I always wondered what happened to you, man. But I appreciate you, brother. And I'm so proud of what you're doing now, man. You, you reaching back in, man. You're giving them brothers voices that need a voice. And you represent the men, man, that came home, man, and the men that's still in. And I applaud you, brother. And I'll be forever grateful to you, man, for helping me when I needed you, man. Okay, okay. So let, let me say that now because, you know, yeah, I'm going to take you off the screen for a minute, uh, 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 Fly, because I want, I want to speak to you and speak to the people so they understand what this thing is about. Yo, listen, man. I got locked up at 29 years old was facing life with no chance of parole. It wasn't my case. It was my brother's case in Virginia. All I did was send my brother drugs. My brother wanted drugs. 
I got it for $10,000 a key, $8,000 a key. I gave it to him for 15. If I was pissed at him, I charged him 20. But in Virginia, we're going for 30 and 35. So either way, he doubling his money. Now, when that played out with my brother, right, they came to me and they said, look, you got a nightclub in New York worth over a million dollars. You know, you got over 30 cars. I know you got plenty of millions. We ain't worrying about none of that. All we want you to do is tell us about these murders on your case and tell us what your brother did and you could put everything on your brother. At this time, my brother was alive. So I told him straight up under no circumstances will I cooperate with the government. I fired my lawyer for bringing that to me, right? I went to trial, I blew trial. I got sentenced to life with no chance of parole, September 15th, 1994. And October 1st, 1994, they came to me and they had me handcuffed in shackle flight. So you see how I learned about my brother. They had me handcuffed and shackled to a table and I'm shackled to the floor. And they laid these big eight by 10 pictures out, the most beautiful gloss you could ever see of my brother with his brains blown out. And these Europeans, I'm not even going to disrespect them and call them crackers, but these Europeans laid these pictures out and I'm looking at green brain matter laid out. And my brother is handcuffed at the time and they're sitting there laughing telling me that the fox hunt is over be a smart nigga and put everything on your brother and tell us what happened and we'll give you immunity immunity means that they won't charge me for nothing and they'll release me and they said he's dead anyway you understand now under no circumstances would I tell on a comrade? It don't matter if he's my blood brother or he's my brother from the street, you know? So I refused that deal. They sent me up to ADX. When I get to ADX, they came and saw me in ADX and they told me I had a legal visit. So that's why I went down. They take me out my cell with like five police with electronic batons. I'm handcuffed, shackled around my waist. I had to go through all this crap. While I'm going through all of this, they put me in a room and they telling me, look, we investigating the death of your brother. We want to know this. We want to know that. I said, hold up, stop. First of all, I don't talk to the police. They told me it was a legal visit. And that's why I'm here for a legal visit. If it's anything to do with my brother and his murder, it's your job to solve it because you didn't help us get the money to get us in this situation so there's no way in hell I'm going to help you solve any murder, not even my brother's murder. And when I walked back to that cell, my knees was like on the cartoons where they're shaking. But I had to remain strong for these racist police up in the mountains of Colorado that was walking me up and they watching me because they can't even picture how I'm still able to stand, much less walk. When I made it to the cell, I fell on my knees as soon as they handcuffed me and left out of my sight and I cried like a baby. So I know what it was like when I heard your tears. I felt your tears was the same as the pain that I went through. And I don't wish that on my worst enemy. So when you told me that they let you call and you talk to your family, and you wanted to get back on the phone, but they wouldn't get you on the phone, you know? When the police started coming down the tier, you know? We flooded the tier, you understand? I flooded the tier, all the homies that was there flooded it, because they said, yo, what's up, New York? And I said, nah, they ain't letting the homie use the phone, da da da, da. So everybody participated, throwing stuff on the tier, where they brought the orderlies out. When they brought the orderlies out, we told the orderlies, nah, y'all can't clean up. Let them come clean it up. You know what I mean? No way y'all gonna clean up this mess and live on this compound, even though we in the shoe and y'all on PC time. This between me and them. Stay out of this. And as men, 
they got off the tier and they told the police. The police came with the brooms and the rubber boots and they cleaned up the mess. So they came and we flooded it again. So when they came, they said, what's the problem? I said, my man just came in and he's trying to use the phone because he lost a family member. And they said, but we already gave him a call. I said, one phone call? That man said he wanted to get back on the phone. If you don't put that man book on the phone, this going to go on all night because we ain't got nothing better to do. You know? And that's when they called the lieutenant down there in the white shirt. I talked to the lieutenant. The lieutenant asked me, do you even know that man? I said, no, but he's a convict. At this point, it don't matter what color he is or if I know him or if he's from my geographical location. This is a man that's going through what I'm going through, and he needs the phone. So the lieutenant was an old convict lieutenant, so he said, you know what? I feel y'all pain, man, you know, because I know what happened with your, with your uh, brother. Because at that time, they Merge magazine just came out and they did 10 pages. If y'all go look up the old Merge magazine, they did 10 pages on my case talking about my brother and Kemba Smith. And then they mentioned my name in the end that I was the kingpin on the case. Now, uh, go ahead. Let me bring Big Fly up. He got a question. Come on, Fly. I remember all that, how you flooded. I also remember when you told me about the Merge magazine, you said, man, look at this. And I read it. So everything you're saying is for real. You ain't wailing or just putting something out there it, that's not true. You did all that. You flooded. You got the people up there to give me the phone. But I remember you said, man, read the article in the Merge magazine. And I read it. You know? See, that's what I'm saying, because it's so crazy, Fly, that when they meet people like me and you on YouTube that they've been covering, you understand? They meet us on YouTube, and they can't phantom the strength of the men they're looking at. Right. You understand? So yeah. anything come out their mouth, you get the rat bastards and flip-flop women and public trolls to try and tear it down to bring you down to their rat level. You understand? But those and, be haters. And, 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 and we learning about that. You know, we learning about that. But I did all that for this man you see on the screen, and I didn't even know him. But I felt his pain, and I felt his tears, and they felt synopsis to the tears that I shed for my brother. But I had no one I could call because at the time, my case was fresh. And if I caught my sister, the feds would have ran to tear her house up. If I caught my brother, they would have ran and tear his house up. So I couldn't even call no one fly. I had to just suck that up on my own. And they can't understand what that was like. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. To Luke, my brother was like my twin, man. Everybody thought we, they think I'm older than my brother. Because I was the wild one and I was on the street first and I was on the street the most and I carried on with the most badness. So my brother was just a fly guy spending money, driving fancy cars with women and da 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 da. So everybody thought I was the oldest because when he was in Virginia fly, my brother would do stuff like this. Let me see him on with you, right? Because you were locked up about the crack era. My brother would do something like it's a drought. Every year they got a drought. Um, they have what they call inventory. It, it'd be in May and June and november and december because those be election times where they stopped sending drugs that was the metal ying the metal ying stopped selling drugs sending drugs to new york so they waited to get all their money up to do inventory the same as any other business so when they do that there's no drugs on the compound and the price of key go up from seventeen thousand to thirty thousand in five hours you know what i mean yeah. you drive yeah listen i went to one block fly and i told a dude Yo, my man just came in. He need a key, and I ain't trying to give him what I got, so I'm going to give you the sale. He said, give me 25000 And I'm like, my nigga, I just gave it to you for twelve. You know? He's like, man, it's a yeah. drought. I said, this is my man. And he's like, right. yo, I want twenty five. I said, man, get up out of here. You never get nothing else from me. I drive right. from 140th Street up to 174th Street to go check the homies. When I got up there, they said they wanted 30000 a key. I said, man, get up out of here, man. I go back to 140th, right, um, 41st up there on Broadway. When I go back up there, they said, now we want 35. This is within 20 minutes. 
they went from 25,000 to 10,000 more at 35,000 by the time I went to 174th and came back. You understand? Yeah. That's how real it was back then. Right. You follow me? Yeah. So now, you know, when that happened, my brother's in Virginia and they all the way lost. There's no drugs because people is bringing down one key at a time, three keys or five keys or whatever. And they take their time and they get a, a, a house down there, a townhouse. They do everything down there. They live down there and they come up. But when they finish and they come up, drugs is fuck, is, excuse the language, is the same price as in New York. You understand? So they like, yeah. man, nah. So they running around trying to look for it. And my brother's down there telling them, yo, my brother getting ready to bring me 20 keys. We're going to be good. Give me your money up front and I'll give it to you for a deal. And my brother collect half a million dollars from dudes. You know what I mean? To buy the drugs that, that go ahead, big bro. He was real smart. See, your brother was yeah. smart. And the government mm. tried to depict him as this notorious drug dealer that manipulated the college girl. But see, mm. I was privileged enough to be next to his real brother. Mm -hmm. He gave me the truth about what happened, how he got him. But, you know, I was telling the youngster today, I said, man, I'm going to tell the unique later on. I told him who your brother was. And I said, you remember the girl who got the presidential pardon? And her mother and father sold their house and used to be on the newspaper and all the talk shows. I said, that was unique's brother. You know what I mean? So... Everything you saying, you know, I know it's true. Cause we stayed in that been talking. Once you told me who your brother was and how they killed him, I said, "Man, I feel your pain, man." And, and and the crazy thing is, at that time, it was less than a year since I lost my own brother, Fly. I know. So I'm holding in my tears to be strong while I'm stuck in 23. And one lockdown for the next five years. I gotta hold this together because every 30 minutes these filthy pigs came through to look to see if I hung up yet. Yeah. You understand? So yeah. I felt the pain, you know. Now, let me tell you how this story played out. So when my brother do that, he got a half a million dollars from dudes. And then now I sent my brother down to 20 keys and he got the keys. And he said, screw them bammers. <laughs> he ain't give them nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I just keep it in my heart. My yeah, brother yeah. said, screw them bammers. I ain't giving them nothing. You know? Right. So right. now, they all hooking up, say, man, I gave Khalif X amount of dollars. You know what I mean? He ain't give me mine. He ain't give me mines either. I'm going to do this to him and that to him. Now I get a phone call in New York that they plotting on killing my brother in Virginia. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, you know this from penitentiary rules. This is just street rules. Right. Your brother could be dead wrong, but he's dead right until you get him alone. You understand right. what I'm saying? We ain't going to check right. him in front of nobody, but we're right. going to support him 100%. You understand? Yeah. So I fly down to Virginia, and I went at the toughest dudes that had the biggest voice that was trying to be the leader of this uprising against my brother. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And right. needless to say, it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just right. to let them know where we was coming from. Right. You understand? Right. So they all thought I was crazy because I didn't go down there to talk. I went down there for one reason. And that was it. Because nothing talks louder than a gunshot. You understand what I'm saying? Ain't no question. You know? So, yeah. you know, they all said my brother was this, my brother was that, but one thing, they could never do nothing to my brother. I shot my own brother because he stole 10 keys from me. You understand what I'm saying? Right. When I brought it to my mother, my mother said, he must be chastised, but don't kill your own brother. Don't let the game have you so screwed up that you take your own brother's life but he must be punished for what he did. You understand? Right. So I just gave him a flesh wound. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? But it's part of the game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's part of the game. But, you know, after that, he was in line. You know, because sometimes that's all it takes. If I would have yeah. killed him, that yeah. would have been the end of it. But right. never would I allow another man to kill my brother or harm my brother. Right. The same way if somebody violate 
You know what I mean? In your car or violate your brother, you check your brother. You put your hands on your brother. Ain't right. nobody else going to do it. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? So I say, I say all that to say that this is a dirty game, man. You know, yeah. don't get involved in it. I got a man on the screen that did 50 years in federal prison, including the nine years halfway house, because you got the rat bastards that'll say, oh, he only did this and he only did that. You understand? Your joy freezed up, uh, freeze, uh, 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 fly. Come back in. All right? Yeah, go out and come back in, big dog. So I'm going to talk to the big homie come back. Now, I want y'all to understand that this is not worth it. I met another young brother, right, while he going out and coming in. I met another young brother while I was doing time named Eon Williams. You know what I mean? I'm going to bring Eon up here. I'm going to do an interview with Eon. I got almost 68,000 people on my YouTube, and I'm opening my page up for everybody to follow Eon Williams. He get ready to start his YouTube back because he locked out of his joint. This is how men represent men. It's not about me having 68,000 subscribers and saying I'm king of the YouTube. No, I got 68,000 people on YouTube. I want to bring my man Bootsy in that got you know, Street Knowledge Podcast, so y'all know to follow Bootsy on Street Knowledge. I want y'all to follow Eon Williams. Right now, he on Instagram on the DC Blacks. That's my man. That's who put me back in contact with Fly. That's how we look out for each other. I'm not, I don't have to come on YouTube and talk crazy about Eon or crazy about my man Bootsy to get views. Because I'm from the era where when one eat, we all eat because when we got beef, we all got beef. So don't just call your comrade when you got beef. Call your comrade when you got 68,000 subscribers. <laughs> you know what I mean? If y'all can't understand that, I don't know what to tell you, but me and Eon and Bootsy from Street Knowledge Podcast, we're leading the way to show you if anybody want to contact me, for me to get on their program, I don't care how big or small. If you not no rap bastard or flip flop wearing the public troll, you know what I mean? I'm gonna look at your page and see what your content is about. Now I got my brother Fly back up here. All right, let's get him back up here. Slam leg, slam leg, slam. Now, right. So that's why I resonated with your pain. But you yeah. told me something, Fly, while we was locked up. You know, when I'm talking through the vent, you said they gave you a kingpin charge because what was going on with Lawton, not just the riot thing, if I'm not mistaken, you know, because you hear you correct it because, you know, our memory kind of fade as it goes on. Right. But you right. told me about, uh, you know, the females, you know, you know, selling themselves in jails, getting drugs in jail, people visiting people in right. the neighborhood, things right. like that. If you right. can speak on that, let them know how you was allegedly... Let me say that again. You know what I mean? So you can say what you want. How you was allegedly intricate in running a kingpin organization that you just mentioned that they finally charged you with after five years. You know what I mean? So how did they allege this went down? I'm going to give you the floor. To be honest with you, brother, see, I don't know nothing about no kilos and all that stuff because I've been there since 73. When I left the street, in 73, we was riding up New York buying spoons from Nicky Bomb. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> in, in the dope boys in the city, man, if you had an ounce of heroin back in the days, you was doing it. But, after decades in prison, and with so many dudes coming in that's into the game, they couldn't sell no dope without paying me on the compound. So once word got out, man, flying will let y'all sell no dope unless y'all take him. So I'm not in the dope game, but I'm affiliated with people that's getting money that's taking care of me. You see what I'm saying? So uh I underestimated the government, brother Unica. When and I say that, I say that because. They scared of anybody, any black man with power. And what happened was 
I pulled a female sergeant that used to be the captain's woman. And uh, she wound up quitting her job to be with me. And I eventually married her in Colorado. She came, I, we got married in Colorado. But anyway, I had several other female officers, which was on my indictment. You know, he don't got the indictment. Several people, you, you can get the indictment. Several female correction officers on my indictment saying that they were supplying me drugs, which was a lie. But they were my they was my women. You know what I mean? So when I say I underestimated the government, I did not realize how vicious and corrupted the government is and how they allow on you just to get a conviction. So in 92, 93, and 94, the same FBI ran out to the uh, U.S. attorney and said, we got to get this dude. Every time a stabbing happened, he will say, fly order the stab. Oh, that's the only indictment. See, I ordered several stabbings and murders. And every time somebody get knocked out, it's a fly order that. So once this FBI agent that first heard about the guy who said he was shot, he was a rookie. But as years went by, he started learning drug laws and mandatory sentencing. And uh, he was uh, assigned to the uh, the Lord, uh, 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 I can't remember the name of the, uh, uh, his position. But anyway, anytime something happened in Lord, he posed investigators. Once he started learning drug laws, he started setting up drug stings for officers that he heard was on crack bringing inmates drugs. I don't know nothing about no crack. I ain't never had no crack. So several officers that was cool with me that I knew used to say, man, this FBI keep coming in here asking about you. So like you just say, a bunch of rats agreed to help him set up some officers and once he got the officers he said if you tell on fly we'll give you a plea bargain so a guy that growed up with me named ronald thompson but everybody called him horse thief bro that used to go i used to be in his mother's house he'd be in my mother's house i said man i heard you you on crack man you gotta slow down man and the fbi tricked him to meet somebody in McDonald's to bring an ounce of cocaine in to a homosexual. And they got him. So he called me and my lawyer. He said, man, they asked me to lie on you. It's about what? He said, they just told me just to say anything, man, because they're trying to get you. He said, but I love you. I ain't going to do that. You know he ain't going to do it because he was a correction officer. He ain't never been in trouble day in his life. He just got weak and started getting high. So here on my indictment too. So they called me and they say, we're gonna take this 10 years back and bring you back from Austin, Wisconsin, if you lie on fly. Lied on my family, lied on me. And what's so amazing, uh, uh brother Unique, all the women that was corrupted us, they held up. They said, We ain't lying on, we going to jail. So Couple of corruption officers, I used to whip, used to punish them. They used to come to lie and say, man, uh, he had us doing this and had us doing that. So they give me a fake indictment. But the indictment is a continued criminal enterprise running a, a RICO conspiracy in the buses counts where they say I had people hit. So when he go to the Chief prosecutor, he said, man, we can't indict this man with no evidence. He said, let's just try it. It's in the magazine. I'm going to let you see it. He said, let's just try it. I want to put him away for the rest of his life. And, and when some reporters came to interview me and did a magazine on me, they said, when they talked to the prosecutor, they said, we never thought we can get that man in indictment for a violent contender criminal enterprise. We lucked up and got that indictment. And you know why, brother? It's because when you take a bunch of squares and put them on the jury 
everyday working people and people and, we, and and when they already know we in prison they say he in prison doing all this they don't believe that the government will lie and make up stuff on people they think that the fbi and the prosecutors is honorable people but they just as treacherous and vicious and liars worse than them lying rats so they looked up and got the indictment give me a 10 count indictment but I got wardens, unit managers, cause Lord and all black. All the people who, who, who grow up knowing me their whole career from privates to wardens, they said, man, we call us to come to court for you, man. We ain't gonna let them people lie on you, say you was running a multi-million dollar drug ring in this prison. That mean we allowed you to do it. My Lord, you ain't called none of them. He sold me out. I said, man, why you ain't called my witness? That's in the magazine too, you gonna see it. He all got copies of. He said, man, I ain't call all the witnesses because you still owe me some money. I said, man, call them people so I can beat this case. Because once I beat this case, go on the street, I'm going to pump you up anyway. I'm going to give you all kinds of money once you beat this case. So he wouldn't. They had a school teacher as my co-defendant. They said he was supplying me drugs that worked in law. He got found not guilty. A dude out of New York that was my cell partner, he lied and said that he was selling dope for me and holding the dope. So uh, I took the stand, man, and I had to fight for myself. Because you got to be able to sell yourself to the jury. You have to be charismatic enough to know how to look the jury in the eyes and say what makes sense, that what don't add up. So I beat five counts. They found the school teacher not guilty. A year later, I gave the conspiracy back, and they kept me with the continued criminal enterprise, 846, and gave me life with no parole. And I told the judge when he sentenced me, I say, I trust that we'll see again, man. Because I, I, I wasn't happy, because I know they ain't had me right. So now my sister, who I called that day when we was on, on the till together, she in the court, you gonna read a, a Washington Post article where they gave me life, she fainted on the floor and the FBI was sitting beside her and looked at her land on the floor. They had to call the ambulance and them to come pick her up. And he looking at her on the floor, snickering, like you black beat, you know what I mean? So now one of my girlfriends, like your brother had Kim, when they had me in Colorado in the Marin, they went and picked her up and say, if you don't lie on this, man, we're going to give you 30 years for conspiracy and take your daughter. She lied. My sister got her a lawyer, and she did an audio video saying how the FBI threatened to take her daughter. They got her phone tapped. They tell her, now we need you to lie on this sister. If you don't lie on this sister, we're going to lock you in and take your daughter. She came to court lied on my sister. They gave my sister 17 years for nothing. This is how vicious the government is, Brother Unique. They so this woman was a church woman, never went to, didn't club, didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't curse. Remember, the, they gave my sister 17 years because she was trying to get me back in court and get uh, witnesses to sign affidavits and statements saying how they threatened Locked my sister up, man, gave her 17 years. The same FBI. And then told her, if you don't lie for us, we're going to go get your mother. The same way I just spoke to your beautiful mother sitting up there thanking me for being home, congratulating me. My mother died thinking every day they're going to come get her, man. That's how vicious the government is. But me being the warrior that I am and me being as strong as I am, I said, man, I'm giving this joint back. Every year I kept something in the court. Every year. You know, brother, you have to self-educate yourself about law when you know they ain't got you right. There's no way in the world I was going to stay in prison for life with no parole about a fake kingpin case and my people live in the project. If I'm making all these millions of dollars with they said, they said in the court, where was the money at? Y'all ain't got no money. Y'all ain't bringing no dope in here. Where was he getting all this money? Where the money at? They said, oh, he spent it on girlfriends and 
and buying women and stuff, cars and stuff. You know the first thing you do when you get some money is take care of your family. There's nowhere in the world my family would stay in the projects living off welfare if I made some millions. But they scared of power, brother. And they said, this dude got too much pain. I grew up in jail. I've been in jail all my life. So if I grow up in jail and I see how different generations change from gener you know what I mean? And everybody that's strong coming low and come to prison, they got to see me. Either you're going to be part of this crew, part of this program, you got to get up out of here. So they didn't like that power you need. So two congressmen out of Virginia went on the Congress floor. And I can let you read the offer to talk about me in Congress. Then they said, I'm part of the reason why they closed Lawton because I was too powerful and I had the whole prison system shut down. And that's how they gave me life with no parole. But a lot of people want to tell a lot had a plan for me. And that's why I'm here talking to you now because I gave it back. I gave the whole life sentence back, except nine months. The judge say. I'm taking the light back. I'm going to send them to nine months in the halfway house. That's how I did the 50. Mm. All right. All right. So now, now, hey, hey uh, you have the Don playing in the back. If you can't turn it down, I'm going to take you okay. off the screen so they don't say nothing. Now, let me say this, right? So you understand that our stories, you know, our stories, when I say our, I mean us that was confined in the belly of the beast that got roped up in this government plan to take down the black man that had a voice that had leadership qualities was created with the CCE, Continual Criminal Re uh, uh, Enterprise, and the RICO. That's why they have Young Thug locked up right now, because they see the power of one black man. When they see, so y'all understand, when they see Young Thug, they don't see a young rapper running around busting his gun, this and that. They see Malcolm X in Young Thug. Malcolm X in Young Thug. They see a young Malcolm X because they know if he started putting out, you know, the right information, he could wind up in Congress, the White House, or wherever need to be. Now, I let Fly talk to my mother today. My mother's 88, you know. My man went with me last night to go shoot the video over at the Victoria. Um, I'm going to air that tomorrow, you know, um, for the New Year's party, Turtle Gang. You know what I mean? My man from Turtle Gang Entertainment shot the video, and when he got home, he found out his 90-year-old uncle died. So that's what kind of put a little, you know, dapper in what we're doing. But I say that to say... I didn't ask to speak to my mother. Any one of my comrades that falls and respect and live and breathe the same morals, codes, and principles that, that I breathe is my brother and my mother is their mother. So I handed Fly the phone. Well, I hand the phone to my mother to talk to Fly. You understand? My mother. Maiden name is Garvey. I'm related to Marcus Garvey, Fly. Let me bring my brother back up here real quick. You know what I mean? Right, right. I'm related to Marcus Garvey through my mother. My mother outlived three husbands. I teased and said, damn, you're getting good, you know what I mean, little pension. You should have married a couple more niggas. <laughs> you know what I mean? That way I wouldn't have to pay money for this house. You know, that's how I tease my mother. But my mother is from the same cloth we from. Right. When I got locked up, my mother had to go on the run from Miami to a number of different states in the United States. And all she kept telling me was, baby, be strong and stand on what we stand on. And that's our morals and principles that we don't turn in our comrades. My comrades used to go to the fly to my house on Sunday to eat Sunday dinner with my mother. So my mother looked at them as her sons, as my brothers. So my mother was like, no way in hell 
would you turn in your brother? And I don't want to be put in a situation where you feel like you have to compromise your brothers for me, which I know you wouldn't. So my mother went on a run for the first 10 years to get past the statute of limitation. I didn't talk to my mother for a decade on the phone because you know you got to full out the phone list. Right. And I didn't want them to track where she was at to go at her. And all my mother kept telling me is, baby, I'm not going nowhere until you come home to me. Right. My mama, the beautiful woman you saw today, and right. I love her to death, man. Tears come to my eyes just thinking about the love that I have for her. Right. Y'all can't imagine what this is like. You know what I mean? That's why I want them to meet men of my cloth that where we respect our mothers, even though we may have disrespected women, that's because we was young in the streets and we didn't have that proper guidance to know to respect our black queens. You know? So we violated. And I take responsibility for that. You know? But at the same time, now that I know better, I respect all women the same as I respect my comrades. Right. You understand? Ain't no question. And that's what the youth have to understand that's out there bucking their mother. Everything my mother told me, everything that Fly's mother told them, Fly's doing today after doing it his way. That's right. Right or wrong? Because your mama told you don't do all the crap when you was doing right or wrong. Right. Ain't no question. You know? Not only that. Go ahead. And not only that, brother, when I was in law, and she said, not only that, brother, when I was in law, and she said, why are you down there acting crazy? Won't you find your corner, sit your butt down somewhere so you can come on? But unique, I was so institutionalized from coming in as a teenager and growing up in prison, sometimes you can become institutionalized and don't know it. And sometimes you can be so caught up on your power, you know what I mean? You can't see past it, man. And there's nothing worse than a man with an ego to self-destruct. You know what I mean? But if if I'm doing a life sentence and I don't think I'm going to never touch down, man, you just live day to day. You live day to day, man, because you don't know what you're going to do today. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. But the main thing is you're trying to survive. You know what I mean? So if I got dudes taking care of me, I say, hey, man, Look out for my mother. Look out for my kids. Look out for my family. Look out for my woman. I'm content. But I didn't have my eyes on the ball to focus on getting out until I got the ADX. You've been there. ADX is a torture chamber. A torture chamber. It, it's, it's a human warehouse. You know, when you go to ADX, you go in downstairs to the R&D under the tunnel. And then when you get in the dungeon in the blocks, you don't see nothing but the sky. I ain't seen nothing but the sky for 26 years, man. And when I gave that license back, everybody in the prison, even the racist police that hated black, came to me and said, congratulations, man. We heard you going home. Police that never spoke to me say, Mujahi, I salute you, man. We heard you gave that time back. Don't know a whole lot of dudes get license back and walk out ADS gate. You know what I mean? So while we on that, I, I want to give a shout out to my brother, man, uh, Nkosi, Shaka Zulu, Nasir, formerly Silk. I love that brother, man. He slept beside me the last two years I was there. When we seen, I was congratulated by my lawyers when I gave the license back. He bust out crying. He said, man, you're going home. He stays in touch with me. I stays in touch with him. I, I, I want to give Zulu uh, uh, little Mustafa's props for being one of my little soldiers. I mainly want to give Ronald Cooley ill and Eon and my little son-in-law Rico and other brothers, man, been supporting me since I've been home. Eon was there from day one. Been guiding me through stuff like I'm in school. About the telephones, cars, my nephew Eric Foster, who was my main man, my son Lil Keith. I had a strong support system, brother Unique, and you know you need that. My partner Ronald Cooley has been with me since we was in Maple Glen, the Juvenile Jones, back in the 60s, and I was 14. Stayed with me in Colorado, still with me today. 
I love him to death. I love his wife, Wanda. But Eon, my nephew, Eric, and, and my, my partner, brother, Latif, the same FBI gave him two life sentences. He gave it back. They've been so supportive, man. There's so many good young brothers out here been supporting me and sticking with me, man. And uh, it's just a blessing that I've been greeted and embraced after 50 years. Because you got a lot of youngsters out here. They don't care about who you is, your name, reputation, none of that. You know what I mean? But the ones that count, the ones that's relevant, you know what I mean? They say, man, you're a living legend, man. And, and we glad to be able to see you and talk to you, man. So it's been... But man, uh, I love Eon to death. See, a lot of people don't know. I knew Eon when he was two and three years old. He's running around the visiting hall and Lord with my daughter. I just take Skittles candy up there to both of them. His mother and father was very close to me. That's why I love him like a nephew because I know him all his life. His father was my partner. And uh, when he wrote Lord and Legends and I seen my name in there, I reached out to him and said, hey, man, I need to holler at you, man. He wrote me, sent me pictures. Good youngster, man, thorough. All the good convicts all over the system. Calls Eon, writes him. And, man, he might not have a dime. But whatever he got, he going to break it down and make sure he sends somebody to sell. That's how thorough he is. You know what I mean? And, man, I was just so glad. When I heard what you was doing, Brother Unique, and they said, man, that's the brother. I said, man, that's my man. Because when you left me, I always try to find out where you was at and check on you, right? And uh, when I heard what you was doing, I said, he supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Cheers. 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 Toast the crime. 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 Hey! Fresh out the can of 26, yeah. he back on the strip, uh -huh. getting back in the mix, yeah. what he mentions a gift, Trust. you stand up ten toes down, and I suggest you pay attention to this, Real. take a little gully posse and put it in hall, uh -huh. he cut from the bottom, back. came up from the bottom, back. drop the book, you should go and get it, an Instagram it. page and a YouTube, you could go and visit, yeah. then you could consider yourself linked in, Real. sit front row and get juice from a kingpin, uh -huh. how he went through it so you ain't gotta go do it, uh -huh. did not pay attention would be stupid, talking about the man that probably put your grandfather on probably the reason that him and your grams got along a man that generated millions on the block did his time never squilling to the cops make an audio Like two G's in the ninth. Yeah. Drop top beamer so shine. Yeah. I let Shorty go, she was wine. Treat her like my past, she behind me. Spin a couple bands on the dapper dan. You be back again, getting green like a Packers fan. No cap, it's a roaring uptown. Baby horn uptown, Dominican bust down. Now we on the positive. You we got a lot to give. Now you trying to stop the kids from being an operative. So take heed, homie, lend the air. He started in uptown, he gon' finish dead. But now it ain't about selling drugs, buying cars. It's about buying property to make the community yard. So we can give back to the youth them. Cause they the truth them. And bless up to all the roots. 